Well, then a modern pessimillennialist Christian sitting in a climate controlled house in his lazy boy watching the evening news on a giant flat screen television watches another dismaying story out of the Middle East gets up and walks into the kitchen where his wife is cooking dinner on a $15,000 stove and he he get opens the the fridge gets out a drink um, crushed ice <laughs> falls into his glass out of the front of the fridge and he and he pours the drink in and then he turns to his wife and says honey it's the last days i'm not sure we're going to make it <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry and uh, I've got another episode coming up right now. Uh, my guest is very well known. He's been on the program before, uh, just, I don't know, a month or two ago when I was down at the Fight Laugh Feast. Uh, he's the pastor, Doug Wilson. Welcome to the show, Pastor Doug. How are you doing today? Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah. It's good to see you again. Uh, miles apart, but we're, we're using the technology that uh, the Lord's provided, so it's good. Yeah. Um, again, appreciate the time. Thank you so much. We're going to be talking about kind of a lot of stuff that you've addressed in one way or another, um, but I hope this is still a help uh, to my audience as it's it's small, but there still seems to be a lot of kind of confusion about Christian nationalism. Uh, post-millennial or partial preterists and, and kind of having an optimistic es eschatology and just even theonomy. Um, a lot of those are big words that either people, they think they know what they mean or they know what they mean and then they don't like it because of something else or so-and-so right. said this or my other favorite guy said that. And, you know, we're all very thin skinned these days, it seems. And so if somebody automatically has a different view, even on eschatology or, or, or partial this or that, they get frustrated or, or, you know, all of a sudden a heretic. Right. So hopefully let's clear the air uh, a little bit. I mean, yeah. you've done that, you know, probably dozens of times. Uh, but again, we'll talk again, three questions, really primary post mill. People hear this and I heard prominent pastor um, that we all know say it was very difficult. It was like a Q and a, he said this fairly recently, I think after world war two, it's very difficult to believe in a post mill view because the question was a QA and a session that the questioner was saying, well, weren't the Puritans, you know, 17, 18th century, weren't a lot of these guys, Jonathan Edwards, those types of guys, weren't they post millennial? Weren't they optimistic about the future? Um, right. what, what is post millennial? We're pretend we're sitting on a plane and we've got, you know, 10 minutes to never see each other again. Somebody asked what that means. What do you, what do you, what do you say? Um, I, I explained first that the millennium is a thousand years of peace that Christians like to fight about. <laughs> so that's the, that's the first thing. That's good. I like that. <clears throat> the second thing is that what it boils down to is whether you've got an opt all Christians of all stripes are optimistic about the ultimate uh, way things are going to turn out. If you believe in heaven, if you believe in the resurrection of the dead, you believe that God wins, his people are vindicated, all of that's true. Um, so Amil, pre-mill, post-mill, everybody's optimistic at that level. The difference has to do with whether you're optimistic about the course of human history prior to the second coming of Christ. So do you think that human history is just going to stagger on pretty much the way it always has, and then Jesus is going to come someday? Or do you believe that it's going to go from bad to worse? getting worse and worse and worse, and finally the Antichrist appears, and then Jesus comes and overthrows him? Or do you believe that the gospel is gradually going to spread through the whole world, and the nations are converted and will come to Christ? And then Christ comes. So <clears throat> it's. do you think it's neither here nor there, it's just going to go on the way it always has, or it's going to get worse, or it's going to get better? Uh, the late Gary North said there's only real two positions, really. There's optimillennialism and pessimillennialism. <laughs> right. Right. So, uh, so as an optimillennialist, 
I believe that the Great Commission is going to be fulfilled, that the nations are going to be converted and streamed to Christ, that uh, Romans 4.13 says it was not through the law that Abraham was to be heir of the world, right? Blessed, mm -hmm. blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Um, so it's it not, it's not um, and in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says uh, we are to pray thy kingdom come. It's not thy kingdom go, <laughs> mm. right? It's <laughs> thy, kingdom, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it mm. is in heaven. So what many Christians do is they transfer blessings that are promised to God's people on earth, and they just transfer them to heaven without a textual warrant. So mm. when it comes to the statement that how can you believe that things are getting better and better after World War One, or after, World War One was what killed um, secular postmillennialism. Uh, so postmillennialism had an orthodox run for several centuries. Then mm -hmm. it, they they lost Je the, you know the Western world sort of uh, dropped Jesus out of it and and secularized uh, an optimistic view of progress, right? Mm -hmm. And World War One killed that. And then World War II, you know, killed it deader, if you if you will. So if someone says, um, how can you believe that the world is getting better after World War II? I would say, how can you believe that it's not going to get better after mm. reading Isaiah? After mm. reading, after reading, <laughs> right? So the issue in my mind is what does the text say? Not mm -hmm. what do the newspaper, not, the question is not what the newspapers say. The, the issue is not what my newsfeed says because everybody knows in in journalism if it bleeds it leads they they're going to rush mm -hmm. the bad news to you um but i want to look at what the promises of god are in psalm 2 and in psalm 22 and in psalm 110 um you know there are many many promises and mm -hmm. um and so i just want to believe those promises i have a lot more to go on than abraham did when yeah you know, when Abraham was taken outside of his tent, you know, Ur of the Chaldees was a pagan city. Abraham had left, you know, the idolatry that he'd grown up in. Uh, he's a nomad living in a tent and God takes him outside and shows him the stars and says, so shall your descendants be. Hmm. Well, what did Abraham have to go on? Well, what he had to go on was the word of God, the promise of God. Hmm. That's yeah. that that should that should be sufficient. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, I was going to ask you that. So you already answered as far as the reason why. I, I mean, is so you think that's the reason why a lot of people will say this or that about, you know, the end times? Well, it's upon us. I mean, uh, we, we would we would spend hours and hours if we trolled the Internet looking for prophecy this and prophecy that. And God showed me a vision and a dream and this thing and that thing and all these people that seem to be very genuine. And like, well, this is happening, and it's the hurricane in Florida, and the election, and Donald Trump, and other things, and the Pope, and the Antichrist. Is it just because people are so they're just stuck in the newspaper, as it were? They're looking at their Twitter feed, yeah, yeah and they're not exactly. looking at scripture. Okay. Yeah. Um, what is it that overcomes the world? Uh, John says in First John, is it not our faith? Not our faith, yeah. And and where does faith come from? Faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Yeah. So. Uh, if if I if I do the exegesis, I should be able to settle it that way, and then that instills in me the kind of confidence that overthrows kingdoms. So mm -hmm. when uh, Hugh Latimer and uh, Hugh, Latimer and Ridley were two martyrs in under Bloody Mary in mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Oxford, and they were burned at the stake, and Ridley uh, Ridley was a younger man and. Latimer was an older man, and when they were tied to the stake, Latimer said to Ridley, play the man, Master Ridley. We shall today light such a candle as I trust by God's grace uh, shall never be put out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what he's doing, he's, he's, he's tied to a stake. He's about to be burned, and he says, basically, we've got them now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's some boldness right? and some faith, my goodness. That, yeah. That's a boldness that's a faith. Well, then a modern pessimillennialist Christian sitting in a climate controlled house in his lazy boy watching the evening news on a giant flat screen television 
watches another dismaying story out of the Middle East, gets up and walks into the kitchen where his wife is cooking dinner on a $15,000 stove. And he, he get, opens the, the fridge, gets out a drink, um, crushed ice <laughs> falls into his glass out of the front of the fridge and he, and he pours the drink in and then he turns to his wife and says, honey, it's the last days. I'm not sure we're going to make it. <laughs> and, and, uh, contrast that with, oh, La- man. So with, with Latter, Latimer and Ridley. Yeah. Wow. Uh, what kind of faith is it? What kind of faith overcomes kingdoms and what kind of faith runs away from Kings? Mm. And, and that's the, in my mind, it's the issue. So is it, if it's scripture first, not my, not my eyeballs, not the newspaper, not, you know, not my panics and fears, Mm. but rather what does God promise us? And what, and what did Jesus tell us to do? Jesus said all all authority in heaven and on earth. Notice that all, he doesn't say all authority in heaven has been given to me. Therefore look forward to when you're going to come up here where I, where I run things. Right. Uh, He says all, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And he says, therefore go disciple the nations. Hmm. Well, that's, that's, that's what we should do. Disciple the nations. Amen. Um, I guess somebody's going to ask what they're thinking. So this means we should force people to come to Christ, right? (laughs) No. Okay. <laughs> Just to clarify everybody. Okay, good. Moving on. No. Uh, I think people hear that though. And that's the thing that's so funny. It's like, you know, oh, that thing with Calvin and he burned that guy or this thing or, you know, controlled what people ate off of or something. Okay, sure. He wasn't, he's not Jesus, right? Like there are some problems that this guy or that guy or this group did, but mm-hmm. we're not talking about forcing people like, well, Muslims do. You have to either pay the tax or become a Muslim. I mean, that's what Sharia <coughs> right. is, right? I mean, that's all it is. Right. Um, but what, what we're talking about is simply evangelism, mm-hmm. preaching the gospel. So uh, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of salvation. Mm-hmm. So there's true authority and power in the proclamation of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And with Calvin and Servetus, the thing that people don't realize is that the Reformation era was the era where um, religious persecution, people being executed for their doctrinal convictions, that era was coming to an end. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it didn't, it didn't turn off like you just hit a switch. It tapered off like it was on a dimmer switch. Mm-hmm. But it was very clearly the Reformation faith that produced... Uh, a wonderful development in the history of the West, which was the doctrine of liberty of conscience. Mm. And so when people, when people express their fear about if the Christians take over, there goes my liberty of conscience. I'd say, what are you, what are you talking about? We invented that. (laughs) That, uh, (laughs) That's our baby. That, that, Mm -hmm. that's like, um, that's like telling Aretha. She doesn't know how to sing. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's good. Um, which I mean, that really that folds right into Christian nationalism. So, kind of our second question. Right. Um, again, few minutes. I know, obviously, uh, was it Stephen Wolf? Right. He he wrote the Stephen book. Stephen Wolf. Was, right. All over the place. I mean, there's everybody's a Christian nationalist, and just like anything else, any other slur, which is funny. I mean, I'm I'm working through a um, I'm writing a church history. But I'm calling it, why are there so many denominations? So it's a little tricky. That way people aren't bored that it's a history class. And uh, this, is a, this is a church. And so it's funny how so many times you see, uh, uh, well, Methodists, right? Or the Holy Club with Wesley and those guys. Uh, or Puritans or even Evangelical or Fundamentalists or, you know, now deplorable. That's not necessarily Christian. But so often the insult becomes what people embrace, um, mm-hmm. and it seems like Christian nationalists is kind of already doing that where you'll have people proudly say, I'm a Christian nationalist and other people are, you know, feverishly typing, ah, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not that at all. I don't, I don't <laughs> love my nation. I don't love Jesus. You know, and there it's David right. French or something. And it's like, I'm sorry, what's going on? Uh, what, yeah. what's Christian nationalism? I mean, I know that book's really, really yeah. long. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, but what is it? I mean, really? So Christian nationalism in a nutshell says that it's possible for a nation or a group, um, a, a civil society, to, um, uh, to love Christ, to organize its affairs around doing what Jesus said to do. 
And when you do that, it's possible for them to function as a nation with borders, intact borders, and seeking their own um, interest within the boundaries of the law of God, um, where you're simply wanting to be a nation that acts Christian. <laughs> yeah. Right? Uh, so what Wolf does is he assumes the nationalism part, that we all, grew, birds of a feather flock together. We are in nations now. And if, if someone says, well, I want, I would like to advocate for Christian nationalism, and someone else goes, ah, you know, ah, um, yeah. I'd say, so what, what is it, what are you? Are you a non-Christian nationalist? Mm. Right? The, the nationalism part's not going to go away. Right. Okay. So do you want to be a part of a nation that chops little babies up into pieces and sells the parts? Or do you want to be a nation that finds that reprehensible? Mm. Okay. What, what kind of nation do you want? And if you say, well, I'd like, a, I'd like it to be a secular nation that doesn't chop up babies, mm -hmm. I'd say, okay, where are you going to get one of those? Yeah. All right. You, you, because on secularist principles, on evolutionary assumptions, on atheistic assumptions, on agnostic assumptions, there's no inconsistency in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Right. We, what we have to do is say, friend, you can't do that. God told us not to. Right. Yeah. No, amen. So, and that, and that's the thing that I'll, I'll sometimes do, and I'm sure you've said it and probably, probably picked it up from you and others that, well, let's just turn it on its head. Like, what's the alternative? I mean, I've had this where people say, well, the Bible's just God's, or it's man's opinion. It's not God's word. And you're like, well, okay. So then we still have man's opinion though. It's not like there's some other contender really that's going to say, I mean, yeah, maybe some Muslims might say, no, no, the Quran is God's word, but you know, we're not looking for Dawkins or, uh, Charles Lyell or Darwin or somebody's work and say, no, actually, let's, this is divine. It's like, you're still stuck with man's opinion if the Bible's just man's opinion. Like, right. <laughs> you don't get away with it. So the alternative to Christian nationalism is, what, secular globalism? You know, humanistic yeah. globalism, uh, godless nationalism, like... There are only yeah. three, there are only three basic grouping possibilities. There's tribalism, there's nationalism, or there's globalism. Mm. Okay, those are the you, you can have fragmented tribalism, you can have na nationalism, or you can have globalism. Mm -hmm. Now, each one of those could be more or less obedient or disobedient to the word of God. So you could have believing tribalism or unbelieving tribalism, believing nationalism or unbelieving nationalism, believing globalism or unbelieving globalism. Yeah. Right? Now, given that, I'd want any one of the believing options over the, any one of the unbelieving options and there'll be problems to solve obviously mm -hmm. there'll be challenges to overcome and there'll be sins to avoid sins to repent of but here's the thing that people don't often appreciate if you enroll in a math class the very first thing you're going to run into, into is math problems <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. Right? so if you want to build a godly society the very first thing you're going to run into is building godly society problems mm. Yeah, that's that's true, yeah. uh, which means that we don't we want to learn the lessons. I, I've been advocating for what I call mere Christendom for a long time. Yeah, I like and I think that there are certain lessons that we should that we should learn from the first Christendom where we don't want to, you know, let's not burn witches. OK, let's right. <laughs> you know, let's uh, let's take let's view the game film and learn some things and then configure our affairs our, our affairs accordingly mm -hmm. but basically people want to assume that decency and propriety in governance in governance is possible without christ mm. and that's and it's just not true yeah that's what i was going to ask you so i guess i, I mean people are just kind of still living on the fumes of 50 years ago 60 years yeah. ago yeah just like well they steal from Christianity and the whole Christian society that America was and the colonies in Europe, Western Europe. And then we're, we're, that's all going away. The foundation's getting washed away. And it's pretty much gone really. Right. And yet they're still pretending, Hey, no, no, we should build a foundation on this, on this water. Or as Schaefer says, you know, firmly planted in midair is yeah. that that's what they're doing. They're just kind of looking at the past, like recent yeah. past and kind of stealing from that. Yeah. The prodigal son is out of money and does, has not yet realized that he's out of money. Mm -hmm. right he's he's lived off of his father's inheritance for a long time 
and he's been buying drinks on the house for everybody and he's out of money and he still thinks he isn't he's he's not yet at the point where he's staring at the pig food he's he's thinking i've i can i can go a little farther i can do it i can um, buy another round for everybody and then they'll be my friend again but mm. it's not going to not going to happen the checks are bouncing yeah no, that's, that's good. That's a good way to look at it. Um, I guess just a, a, a kind of side point to this. What do you personally think? I know in the next 10 to 20 years seems to be getting, again, you know, this is where so many people look and automatically the Antichrist, right? Just like Obama and the Pope and everybody else was the Antichrist and Hitler and all that. Uh, but but the next, the, the immediate future, you know, when I'm old, uh, in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, do you think based on kind of how we're, we're going that we would go more tribalism is probably the result or more, uh, more globalism or what, what's your kind of feel and personal opinion on that? Yeah, I think, I think we're going to, we've got about nine miles of bad road ahead of us. I, th I think that it's going to be pretty bumpy. I, I think it's going to be nationalist, but mm -hmm. I think the nations are going to be smaller. Oh, so, so, um, so not quite tribalist. It's sort of like tribalism would be like Somalia, a failed state in Somalia, and you've got uh, rampaging warlords or, you know, oh, okay. some, you know, Mad Max uh, uh, kinds of things. Gotcha. Um, that's that's sort of reverting to a state of nature, mm -hmm. which I don't think is I don't think is going to be the case, but I do think that. Um, that it's possible for nations to break up into smaller nations mm -hmm. with uh, affinities that are either ethnic or cultural or historical or, you know, whatever. So mm -hmm. your Europe would have, oh, well, like the crack up of the Soviet union would be part of that. Um, uh, if, if things can continue to, to disintegrate here in the States, I could see a fragmentation happening in America but it wouldn't be, I think it'd be two or three or four large pieces, mm. not, not 150 tribes. I, d I don't think gotcha. that's going to happen. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Um, so the other kind of big buzz thing that's gotten a lot of press, especially from, from you all there in, uh, there in Moscow um, is theonomy, which obviously is just law. Um and the, the inverse of that really is antinomian or anti-law. Uh, can you just kind of, again, for the guy, I've got, I've got friends, I know people that comment, they've got other channels and they do work and pastors and so on. And, and they, they'll say, well, so-and-so says this, well, Doug Wilson, so-and-so, or this or that, or, well, they want, you know, they, they think we need to keep the law to stay saved or get saved or, or partial keep the law or, or whatever. What what is the law? I mean, we see right Romans three twenty. Uh, you know the knowledge of uh, the law brings the knowledge of sin. Of course, Galatians mm -hmm. uh, and Acts fifteen. People get circumcised or not? What's that's the how do you get saved? So explain kind yeah. of the the nature of the law for us. Okay, so um, when people ask me if I'm a theonomist, my standard joke is, oh no no, I hate God's law. <laughs> Right. And they say, oh, you know what I mean? And I say, no, actually, I don't, because every Christian believes that we should do what God wants us to be doing. <laughs> right. So let's say we're all let's say we're having a discussion between evangelicals. That means we all believe that it's salvation is by grace through faith. Um, you've got to be, you must be born again if you have had uh, if God's given you the gift of regeneration you're you're born into new life okay and and nothing can touch that and christ has saved you by grace plus nothing else that and let's say that happens sunday at a sunday night worship service monday morning is still coming and i've got to figure out how i'm going to behave mm -hmm. monday tuesday wednesday thursday what how do i live or schaefer <laughs> schaefer put it how should we then live Mm -hmm. right, so I, I've been saved by grace. Let, let me take that as a fixed given. What what should I do? How should I walk? <laughs> well, I should walk in love. What does love look like? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 13, owe no man anything except the debt of love. And he says, 
and then he then he goes through a bunch of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And then he says, and whatever other commandment there may be are all summed up in this. Love your neighbors yourself. Mm -hmm. So I believe that theonomy is simply nothing more or less than loving your neighbor. <laughs> right? right? Yeah. And, and the law of God tells me what love looks like in a particular situation. So the debate between Christians <clears throat> is not over whether or not we should be doing what God wants us to be doing in our Christian lives. We all agree with that. The debate is an exegetical one. How, how do we interpret and apply these Old Testament passages in the modern world? Okay, that's but that's an exegetical application issue, not a principial issue. The principial issue should be settled. We should be wanting to do it God's way, not man's way. Mm -hmm. We should want to. We should want to do it God's way, not my own way. Um, and then if someone says, "Well, does that mean that you you have to build a balustrade around the roof of your house because God's law um, requires that?" Mm -hmm. Um, when when people press me on the theonomy thing, I say I'm, I call myself a general equity theonomist, mm -hmm. which is a phrase taken from the Westminster Confession, because okay. the Westminster Confession divides the Old Testament law into three categories. There's the moral law, which is constant and abiding in all generations. It always looks the same. Mm -hmm. So uh, refraining from adultery is always the same thing. Refraining from stealing is always the same thing. That's mm -hmm. the moral law. Then there's the ceremonial law, the sacrifice of bulls and goats, which was all fulfilled in Christ. So Christians no longer sacrifice bulls and goats because they look to the completed sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Okay, that's the second kind of law, fulfilled law. Mm. The, the third kind of law is judicial. And the Westminster Confession says judicial law applied to Israel during the time Israel was a civil society and expired when that civil society expired. Okay. Okay. Ex except, they said, except as the general equity thereof may require. Okay. So in ancient Israel, they required a balustrade around the roof of their house because people would go up there in the evenings to cool off and you didn't want a neighbor falling off and breaking his neck. Right. Okay. So, if I were uh, my joke, another joke is if I were president and what a glorious three days that would be. <laughs> right? uh, <laughs> I'd vote for you. Uh, yeah. If, but if I were um, a judge, let's say sitting on a case and a case came up before me that uh, where someone had fallen off a second story deck that mm -hmm. didn't have a, didn't have a railing. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, but it wasn't the roof of the house. It was the second story deck up above the ground. I would have no problem saying I'm, I'm going to find for the plaintiff here. And the homeowner was responsible to keep that area safe because, and it's then cite that reference. I, what I, but I'm not citing the specific code. I'm citing the general equity of that code. Mm, okay. The, the general equity Helpful. would say you ought to, uh, shovel your sidewalk so that ice doesn't form on it. You ought to cover the well so little kids don't fall down the well. You mm. should, you know, th that's the general equity of the law, which I think is still authoritative. Yeah, that's good. Um, I just thought of one last one. You got time for, for one more question? Yep. Michael? Has the church replaced Israel? <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> That's another one. Okay. So, yeah, what, what do you got? I mean, again, these, I'm just trying to get as much okay. as I can. So, so the church is uh, the church is Israel now. The church is, I'm convinced, the new Israel. Okay. Uh, and this this happened because uh, the old Israel never went away, and I think the image of the old Israel is the olive tree in Romans 11. Hmm. In Romans 11, that olive tree straddles Old Testament era and New Testament era. The Jews who rejected Christ were cut out of the olive tree. Mm -hmm. Caiaphas was cut out of the olive tree. 
other unbelieving Jews were cut out of the olive tree. And Paul says, believing Gentiles are grafted into the olive tree, but it's still one tree. Mm. It's one tree that has gone back to the time of Abraham, at least, right? So it's this one Abrahamic tree, and Gentile branches are grafted in. Unbelieving Jewish branches were cut out. So that Abrahamic tree is Israel. Okay, that yeah. that is Israel. So I'm I'm part of Israel now. The mm-hmm. um, when Paul quotes Deuteronomy, the first commandment with a promise, he, uh, that's a promise that was given to Israelite kids at the base of M- Mount Sinai. Mm-hmm. But Paul picks it up and applies the promise to Gentile kids in Ephesus, and he, yeah. and he says, "This is yeah. the first command with a promise. This promise is for you for your life in the earth." Mm-hmm. So I believe that the church is Israel now. But the but the uh, I do believe also, in line with Romans 11, that the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, meaning that the Jewish branches that were cut out of the olive tree and are stacked up in a bundle next to the orchard are going to be grafted back into the tree. Mm. Okay, and Paul's argument is if the wild olive branches grafted into the tree uh, took so readily, how much more will natural branches uh grafted back into the tree take to it and if the excision of unbelieving jews was such a blessing for gentiles what will their inclusion be but life from the dead Mm. no that's good so is that then i guess like end times because even when i was in because we were i was saved in a church that was planted actually by macarthur's dad a long long time ago in southern california and um you know it was all very pre-mill dispensational and there really wasn't much explanation of ah mill, post mill, anything like that. I didn't even know there was really distinctions even within when the rapture is and all this other stuff. Okay, so I don't really, I'm not leaning that way anymore. Uh, although I'm going to try and do a robust study for everybody at some point. But anyway, yeah. um, there was always in my mind like, well, okay, but these people are saved by grace, Gentiles, yeah, praise God. But like, but the Jews, there's a separate salvation for them still. Is that is that what I just heard you say, or is that? still a pre no, is that like a there's, there's only one way of salvation and that's okay. christ so okay. dispensationalists hold that jews and christians can be saved different ways basically like, okay and and i believe that jews and gentiles all have to be saved the same way through christ through faith in christ okay. but when when a jew believes in christ he's grafted back into the true israel gotcha gotcha okay so he's not only ethnically Jewish, because obviously we see places like, you know, not all Israel are Israel, Paul writes, uh, right. and other places where, you know, the new Israel and like you said, with Romans there and the covenant and the branch, the branch is being broken off and grafted in. Um, OK, right. that's that's super helpful. That's really good. Um, cool. No, this was this was good. That that flew by. So yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. What do you got going right now? Anything? I know you've you're blogging, of course, at DougWills.com, Right. And right. then. Uh, Canon Press is on YouTube. You've got the Canon app going. Uh, what going. projects are you working on writing-wise? Um, I just finished a book called Chestertonian Calvinism, okay, and um, which I'm hoping to release within the next week or so. Should be soon. And um, uh, and then the we just released the documentary, How to Save the World in Eleven Simple Steps. Yeah, that's so, right. And that's kind of that's Gashmu saith it, but in a documentary, correct? Right. Correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah, right. I know you've, you've heard some pushback from uh, the Gashmu say it. I love the title, but you <laughs> yeah, know, me too. I, me I think too. some people are like, well, Gashmu, I think of like cashews or something, which I have weird, <laughs> weird associations. So you can, you can tell people that if you want, but uh, no, this is great. So again, thank you so much. Everybody check out, you. If, if you don't already know, uh, Canon Press and, and Doug Wilson and everybody uh, up there in Moscow, of course, Toby Sumter's up there, Jared Longshore. Um, New St. Andrews College, you guys are you guys are a powerhouse up there. So I'm I'm deeply thankful. I know many people are, many of the audience that well, watch this regularly are. So again, thank you for the time. And thanks. Uh, y'all have a great day. God bless. Yeah. God bless. Thanks.